I want to welcome everyone. Thank you. Thank you all for coming today. We have folks here in the room. It's great to see so many people here. Um, and we also have folks joining online. So welcome to everyone. Um, just want to get a sense of who's in the room, I guess, virtually and here so people can raise their hands virtually as well. So um, who here is representing or connected to a community land trust? Excellent, a lot of folks. Who is in academia? Can raise your hands high, okay. <laughs> Who's a student? Great, bunch of students. Who's here from government, from a government office? Excellent, and philanthropy? All right, so we got a great mix of folks in the room and I assume virtually, I don't, I can't see that, but. Um, so my name's Alexa Kasdan. I'm the brand new executive director of the Pratt Center for Community Development. I started last week. Um, Pratt, um, Pratt Center is part of Pratt Institute, which is the school. We're a research center within Pratt Institute. So that's where we're being hosted today at the Manhattan campus. Pratt Center is in its 60th year and we work for a more just, sustainable and equitable New York City. And we do that through community-driven planning, research policy, and through partnerships with community groups and coalitions. So just some quick housekeeping. Um, we are asking folks to be masked. So if you have a mask, if you don't have one, I believe there's a bunch at the front table. Um, and we also, the folks that are online will be able to participate in the Q&A. There will be some additional instructions on how to do that later. Um, and then the bathrooms are located at the end of the hall. So if you go out these double doors and to your left, there's a long hallway and there's bathrooms at the end of that hallway. Um, though there's one other thing I've been asked to tell you, the room is miked. So just be mindful if you're talking or whispering to your colleagues, you might get caught on. <laughs> <laughs> um, so as I said, this is my second week as executive director of Pratt Center. And I couldn't be more excited to start my time by hosting and introducing this panel. Um, I'm thrilled to be able to step into work with such great partners like New Economy Project. I've worked with New Economy Project on several um, projects in my past life, public banking, also have done some work on community land trusts. Um, and I've watched the CLT movement grow from its early days. I was a coordinator of the Right to the City Alliance back in the day um, where we strategized with Picture the Homeless around community land trust in the early days. So it's so exciting to see where the movement is today and thrilled to be, to be here. Um, so why community land trusts? We know that the city has a serious affordability crisis. So recent studies have shown that, you know, oh, people cannot afford their basic needs. Over 50% of New Yorkers cannot afford their basic needs. This is especially true for communities of color. Um, we know it's impossible to find an affordable apartment. And so community land trusts offer a key part of the solution by taking land out of the private market and allowing communities to have control. So really this is about building community power and ensuring real people can have a decision about what happens in their neighborhoods and how their neighborhoods develop. Um, and so today there is over there are over 20 community land trusts and this has mostly happened over the last decade, which is incredibly exciting. So there's a lot of momentum around this movement. Um, so that's why we're doing this panel. Uh, we'll hear from advocates from the New Economy Project, the New York City Community Land Initiative, and reps from community land trusts across the city um, who have helped to win local policy and develop CLTs in their communities. Um, you'll also hear from Sylvia Morse, um, who wrote our recent report called Gaining Ground, um, which is in collaboration with the folks here on the panel today. And so Sylvia will talk about some of the recommendations from the report and offer some examples of successful models from around the country and from New York City. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Day Del Rio, um, a, the co-executive director of New Economy Project, who will be moderating the panel and just wanna thank everyone again for being here and super excited to work with all of you in the future. So, thanks. Thank you. 
Thank you so much, Alexa, and congrats on the new role. We're also very excited to work with you and the track team, and we want to thank Pratt for co-sponsoring this event with Move Economy and which is New York City Community Land Initiative, which is an alliance that we call NICELY uh, for short, so you're going to be hearing that a lot today. Um, thanks to everyone for joining. The last I heard, we were approaching 300 RSVPs between in-person and online registrants, and I think that this is testament to the growing interest in the CLT movement, which is fast growing. Um, just a little about our organization. Uh, New Economy Project works citywide and statewide with community groups um, to build an economy that works for all, that's rooted in racial equity, in cooperation, and in ecological sustainability. For almost 30 years, we've collaborated with groups in coalition and on campaigns to challenge systemic discrimination and wealth extraction in our financial system and our broader economy. And we work with groups also to promote affirmative solutions, including community land trusts, public banks, and other um, strategies that build and that democratize our economy and build power and collective wealth. About a decade ago, New Economy Project uh, came together with Picture of the Homeless, whose members had identified CLTs as a tool to address root causes of homelessness and housing insecurity, and really helped ignite growing interest in the CLT model in New York. So with PTH and allies in City College and other <laughs> organizations and academic institutions, um, we came together to form nicely this citywide alliance At a time when uh, when few people in New York City uh, knew what a CLT was, notwithstanding Cooper Square CLT's decades of success, um, very few policymakers, even affordable housing groups and others knew what a community land trust was. And so the coalition spent a bunch of its early years developing popular education uh, tools, doing countless community workshops and presentations really just helping people understand what a CLT was, how it could benefit our community and help address root causes of our housing and uh, greater affordability crisis. Um, this, the coalition helped to launch the first CLT in decades in New York, which has now become the East Harlem El Barrio Community Land Trust um, and much, much more. So we're now not only um, we not only were able to start a new CLT in East Harlem, but we have, as you heard, 20, more than 20 CLTs organizing across all five New York City boroughs. And this is a very extremely, uh, a very exciting and important time for the community land trust movement. About one third of those 20 CLTs either own or are in active stages of acquiring land. It's through that ownership of land, which you'll hear about, that CLTs control the terms of development on top and make sure that that development, whether it's affordable housing or other sorts of improvements on the land, that it meets community needs and stays affordable forever. You're gonna hear from groups today about their work stewarding affordable rental and supportive housing, shared equity co-ops, storefronts for local small businesses, accessible waterfront and green spaces, cultural and community centers, and much more. CLTs have put forward plans. Um, other CLTs that haven't yet acquired land have identified properties in their neighborhood, including vacant lots that they um, are working to transform and bring into productive use in their communities through community-driven planning. CLTs are increasingly working with organized tenants to collectively purchase and stabilize their buildings and housing. On the policy front, we've made major headway. So we are, we've secured, and you know, we'll talk more about this during the Q&A, we've secured a near supermajority of city council members as sponsors of key planks in the Community Land Act, which is legislation, set of bills that are going to be game-changing for CLTs, for the movement, helping them bring land and housing into permanently affordable community control. We've also worked with the city council to launch a new initiative that's directed more than $6 million in the city budgets over the past five years for CLT organizing, legal and technical support, and other capacity building, helping to strengthen and grow this movement across the city. At the state level, we're organizing with Housing Justice for All and others to win legislation and funding for CLTs and other forms of social housing as a next stage in the fight for tenant power and housing justice. 
And we're working together to develop strategies so that we can bring more capital into community land trusts so they can create and preserve more affordable housing at the deep affordability levels that their communities need and other sorts of development to help strengthen and uh, ensure sustainable, healthy neighborhoods. So with all this growth comes lots of opportunities as well as challenges. We're gonna get into all of that with all of you. And we're very excited um, to engage all of you in the work. We're gonna have take action, uh, ways for y'all to take action uh, at the end of the conversation. And we, uh, again, thank you for, for being here. I'm just gonna wrap up with a couple of very quick shout outs. First, I wanna shout out uh, the Nicely Coalition organizer who works at New Economy Project on the CLT campaign, Elise Golden. Many of you know where you will hear from if you reach out to get involved. Um, Elise also just took a 10 hour bus to be here from Virginia and mm -hmm. straight. So I just want to wow. publicly kind of embarrass well, so thank her for being that valiant effort. Um, and Will and the rest of the New Economy Project team that's here today. Um, I want to shout out some of the other Nicely members who aren't on the panel and who aren't on the CLT map that you see here, but are instrumental um, to getting to moving this work forward by providing brilliant and just steadfast support to CLTs. So that includes uh, colleagues of ours at City College of New York, who um, were at the table when Nicely formed and continue to provide organizing and other support to groups. Um, we have Take Root Justice, who's a brilliant legal partner to many CLTs and other community controlled initiatives. City, um, oops, I mentioned them. Uh, we have Community Service Society in the coalition, providing tons of research and policy support. CUNY Laws, Community and Economic Development Clinic, Hester Street, and so many more. And of course, there's Cooper Square CLT and MHA, um, which have you know built and sort of broken the ground for CLTs in New York since 1994, stewarding hundreds of units of deeply and permanently affordable housing. And if you haven't seen the film yet about Francis Golden and the fight for Cooper Square called Rabble Rousers, please go see it. How many of you have seen that? I'm just curious. All right, I'll see that. Okay, let's move on to the panel. If I forgot anybody, I apologize. The movement is big and growing, um, and we're excited to be with all of you today. Okay, so first some logistics. So we're going to start the panel. We have an amazing panel, and we're going to start with everyone giving about five minutes of an overview of the CLT. Then we're going to have um, a Q&A portion that I'll facilitate, and we'll be taking questions from people both online and in the room. If you're in the room, raise your hand, and people, someone will come around with a mic to get your question. And if you're online, please put your questions in the Q&A box. There's a host who will be moderating and sending those to me and I'll be repeating them live. All right, hybrid events, let's go. <laughs> so if you've been uh, following the CLT movement in New York City, our next presenter will be no introduction. <laughs> <laughs> Ms. Ack. Okay, Ms. Ack is a steering committee member of the East New York CLT, and I think you have a much longer title as well that you can share with folks, um, and is part of the brilliant uh, East New York Community Land Trust organization that has been extremely active since the um, pandemic hit and is a leading force in this movement in New York City. So, Deborah. Yeah. Um, my name is Deborah, and I'm a member and founding member of the East New York Community Land Trust. How I got involved with the East New York Community Land Trust, I also have a nonprofit organization that I was looking for storefront, a storefront property to start up my um, nonprofit organization, which would have been a resource center slash food pantry. And East New York, the retail space was the rent for the retail space was astronomical. I'm like, I'm a non for profit organization starting out. How do I pay for this retail space? So I happened to see a flyer one day said, East New York Community Land Trust, entrepreneurship. I said, ah, that's the one for me. Let me see what they can do for me. So I went to that meeting and have been continuously involved with the East New York CLT. That meeting changed my frame of thinking. I have put my non-for-profit organization on the back burner for the past three years. 
because the East New York CLT was um, started during the pandemic, which made it a little bit easier because nobody had anywhere to go. And when we sent out the information for our one-on-one -on -one workshops, we got a lot of um, responses and a lot of people attended our workshops. So like I said, I put my non-for-profit organization on the back burner because I see the bigger, pe the bigger picture for East New York. First of all, uh, I love East New York because of its growing population, the growing family unit that it has become. Um, I love that the fact that 95% of it was one to four to eight family homes or rental units. Um, I see the change where the land has been given to high-end developers and they're building 10, 12, 14 story apartment buildings in my community. And the buildings that they're building are not affordable for the people who live in my community. So it, just being a part of the ECL CLT has really, really changed my mindset about how things should be done in our community. Yes, the land is ours. We need to take back our land and give it back to the people of the community and let them control the land. Let them decide as a community what is to be built on these vacant lots, what how the rental should be um, dispersed amongst the community because the HPD people use AMI and I hate M AMI. It should be NMI, neighborhood medium income. It should be decided on what the neighborhood can afford, not what the area, which includes Long Island, Suffolk County, all those people who make six figures and more. Um, that should not be determined on what the rental unit should be. But I'm going to stop here because I can go on and on. <laughs> and I'm going to turn it back over the day. We're going to hear more from Deborah about some of the projects that East New York is actively pursuing, which are very really exciting, and many. East New York has a very deep bench, and yet you're always marveling at how much work they can accomplish with, is it still one, two staff people? One. One staff person. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then a whole bunch of volunteer um, heavyweights. Okay. Yeah. Next up, we have, um, we're going to hear from Alexis Foote, um, who is a longtime Far Rockaway resident, who we first met when you were fighting after Hurricane Sandy for a CLT in your community, and fast forward. So today, you're a board member of the Real Edgemere Community Land Trust. Yes, thank you so much for having me here, everyone. So once again, um, my name is, um, just to put it my hyphenated, Alexis Smallwoodfoot. Um, I was, a, um, so when I moved to Rockaway, I was a single mother coming out of homelessness. Um, I moved to Ocean Village. We are now branded as Auburn Fuel. Um, and I've been in Far Rockaway for 17 years. So what happened was Hurricane Sandy happened. And I said, the developers are going to come in here, just like they did home, and they're going to gentrify us. And I said, oh, my dead body, would I let that happen? <laughs> and so I started working with Jean DuPont from the Rockaway Waterfront Alliance in Far Rockaway. And I was telling her all my dreams, like, I'm going to be a business owner. I want to be a homeowner. You know, I want to save my community. And she's like, well, you can't do that unless you have the people People support the people that live in Rockaway. So I said, well, how am I going to do that? She said, well, I got this amazing person named Kaylin Callahan. She's a part of this great group, this great group called um, Occupy Sandy. And from there, they started um, Rockaway Wildfire. And so I was like, okay, I'm down. So when I met Kaylin Callahan, I ended up also meeting Paula Siegel, which um, at the time we ran 596 Acre. And we became like the three musketeers, right? Mm -hmm. And I was the Rockaway Wildfire. And I was like, I'm going to do this land advocacy thing. We're going to do this. And then I started learning about community land trust, you know, working with you know, Rockway Wildfire, Occupy Sandy, and the whole movement to um, fight for community benefits agreements. So this is what happened. So LNM got um, acquisition to 81 acres of land in Far Rockaway, which is now considered Arbor East. So it's um, a nature preserve. It's going to be housing. It's going to be development. So we were fighting for that. It wasn't successful. The coalition was called Upper Coalition. But from that, I said, 
I'm going to still continue this land advocacy. So along with 596 Acre and my team, well, at the time, Robert Paul had disbanded due to the unsuccessful of the, of the community benefits agreement. So me and Paul kept at it. Paul was like, oh, just do this one little lot. And I said, okay, so with this lot, I was able to start a community garden, right? And with that community garden, I was saying, listen, we could do this, then the city needs to do that. And that's during that time, I was banging down the door of um, Donovan Richards, which is now my Queens borough president, and the de Blasio, because him and de Blasio around that time were running around together. So I was like, go de Blasio, you can't do this for CLT. You can't keep giving our land to developers, right? I was like, reparation, go here at the bottom sale. <laughs> so then during the pandemic, that name, HPD was like, Alexis, we're going to come out with the RFEI um, for the CLT, so make sure you you are in the loop. So I kept, you know, they kept keeping me updated. So during the pandemic, they did have an um, orientation about the RFEI and things of that nature. And then um, from that, they told the people in that group, like, listen, come together, do a proposal. You know, we want you to work together. So what I did was, out of the 113 people, I sent everybody an email. And I said, my name is Alexis Foote. I want to put a team together to build a CLT and engineer. And whoever got back to me, I told the ancestors that'd be part of my team. So the people that reached out to me was Taking Justice, um, Banshee Architects. She's also a CUNY professor at um, CUNY. David Corinne from Figment. And Figment does art um, activations. They've done it for um, Rims Island, very other places. They've been around for, for years. Um, and then I also have my technical advisor at the time, who was Deborah Morris. Um, and, um, and then Zakia. My lead grant applicant, she joined the application at Hester Street. And then from there, um, HP actually picked up our application in conjunction with Urbane. And we were asked to kind of like see if we could work with them. We tried negotiations, but we both, um, we wanted different things and that's fine, right? So we told them that we would basically let HPD um, review our application separate from theirs. And God is so good that HP actually um, picked our application. So me and Zakia and our board are now um, owners of 119 lots. The goal is 52 of the lots being ownership. <laughs> and then two commercial spaces. And so with that being said, don't let nobody tell you what is not possible because it is possible. And I will pass on to the game. South Bronx, like East New York, um, like in Far Rockaways, we're communities that are have been left behind for decades um, and been planned on, but not planned for. Um, in my Haven and Port Morrison, the South South Bronx, our community has been like a victim of environmental racism and social injustices for decades. Um, our community land trails, my and Port Morrison land stores was founded out of the fight for environmental and social justice. Uh, we saw over and over how public land was not being provided or providing public benefits. In fact, public land was being used to kill us. Uh, it served using public land to create highways that encircled us, uh, public land to make the largest significant maritime industrial areas in the city, public land to bring in fossil fuel power plants and waste transfer stations, Public land given to private developers for 99 years for nothing, where they made tens of millions of dollars because they were friends of governments. So when we saw how that public land was like the nucleus of all the environmental harm that was taking place in our community, was in it was enabling us to well, was not enabling us to breathe healthy air and then healthy quality of life. Uh, we thought that we need to look at how public land can then be uh, provide the kind of benefits we needed in terms of healthier outcomes. Um, but then we start seeing how that same public land was now being given away to developers for housing. So where we were fighting for the right to breathe, now we're fighting for the right to stay. Where really speculation was hitting our door, where it hadn't before. 
were like one of the last communities that one stop away from Manhattan on a train was now being gentrified. It was now being speculated. It was now threatening people with rising rents, rising taxes, and displacement. So not only are now we fighting for the right to, to breathe, we're fighting for the right to stay. And we thought, well, what can we use as another tool to stop that cycle of harm that's been taking place, of top-down decision-making, public land being used against us? What can we use as a natural closing force to really speculation? And we thought community land trust would be that model. But we didn't want to reiterate or reinvent or redo the harm others have done. And we didn't want to commodify land. We want to steward it. So in our name is our mission. The mighty even Port Morris community land stewards. Because we're trying to steward this land. We're trying to go back to the ways of the Native American, how land should be providing the health and wellness for our communities, but we also need to protect it as well. There's an environmental responsibility we need to take hold of as well. So our community looked at how we could utilize the public land for creating quality of life first. Um, even though housing is a quality, it's definitely is needed for quality of life. When we had multiple envisioning sessions with our community and what we could do together and looking at asset mapping of vacant, available, underutilized public land, we looked at creating a waterfront plan. We looked at community, a community center to create the kind of health and wellness um, educational outcomes and bettering that to better our situation locally and housing would come thereafter. But step one was being healthier outcomes. So um, my name for most community stewards came from that fight for environmental justice, looking at how that has hurt us in terms of how lands have been abusing its residents in the South Bronx and other parts of the city as well. Like I'm sure a lot of the talk will be about land. Um, but it's really about community too. You know, how, and we knew the hard work and we had been doing this for uh, probably five or almost a decade earlier with South Bronx Night before the CLT of just trying to organize our community, which is the most important, the hardest thing for us to do. I'm gonna do some quick follow-ups um, for everybody after we go through our last, uh, go through the panel, but please start adding your questions into the chat. And for those in the room, start thinking about your questions as well. So we're gonna wrap up the panel with Sylvia Morse, who's a program manager um, for policy at Pratt Center and who uh, came to us with the idea of putting together a report that really documented the major growth of CLTs over the past decade. And um, I know there's some one pagers and we hope everyone gets to check out the full report. And thank you to Sylvia for joining today. Take it away. Thank you. Thanks so much everyone for being here and for amazing panelists. I'm so excited for this conversation um, and also this report it wouldn't have been possible without your collaboration. So thank you. Um, so yeah, so we, in last spring, put out this report looking at, you know, as has been talked about today, the tremendous growth of the CLT movement. There are now over 20 CLTs being organized in New York City, the majority of which were organized over the past 10 years. Um, if we go to the next slide, there's the timeline where you can see, um, and, you know, the, the first CLT that got land from the city um, after Cooper Square CLT was East Harlem El Barrio Community Land Trust, which was three decades later, right? So, and then since then, we've seen a number of CLTs successfully beginning to acquire land from the city and continuing to organize. So if that gives a sense of both the deep roots of this movement in New York City and the tremendous recent growth. So we really wanted to look into, and the report goes into more detail, and I'm sure we'll talk about it in the panel, um, the advocacy and organizing to begin to get some city support in the form of land financing. Obviously, there's city council discretionary money that's been fundamental to the growth of Nicely and member community land trusts. But then also looking at what are the barriers that CLTs are continuing to face? Why is it that the majority of CLTs are still fighting for land, even as the city, you know, mentions CLTs as an important model in its um, current housing plan. Uh, you know, that we're sort of seeing forms of support, vocal support, but there isn't like a comprehensive approach yet to how the city is looking at building out community land trusts. Um, and I think, you know, as someone with a planning background and as part of Pratt Center for Community Development, I think 
it's interesting to look at a big part, and I think you can hear it in the individual stories of each community land trust here. There's sort of part, obviously the fundamental factor that has led people to community land trusts is the, the material challenge of affording their housing, of finding places for businesses that serve the community. But there's also, I think, years of you know following the Bloomberg administration and the blitz of rezonings and the lack of democracy in that pro process, I think, is what drove a lot of people to thinking about, well, how do we actually have some form of community control and planning in the places that we call home? And I think those things have all contributed to the growth of community land trusts in the city. So um, I will quickly go through some of the recommendations that we've talked about in the report and that come out of um, the CLT movement and the organizers and advocates who've been working deeply on this issue. Um, so we kind of put them into three categories of ways that the city could help take CLTs to the next level. So one is land. You can't really have a community land trust without the land. So there are a few ways that the city could help um, direct more land to community land trusts. The first is kind of righting the wrongs. We were hearing examples of this. Um, basically, since the Koch administration, since the fiscal crisis, the city has been treating its land assets as something to be offloaded. Um, in many cases, you know, there basically are laws say, unless there's some other law that says there's an express public pur uh, purpose, the city has to get the most money as possible it can get. So we saw a lot of the land that the city had acquired um, through in rem foreclosure and the fiscal crisis going out through city auctions, right? Um, other kinds of dispositions. In cases where it is being disposed of, sold basically, um, for a public purpose like affordable housing, the majority of that is still going to private um, developers. So to sort of reverse course, um, there's a, a bill that is part of the Community Land Act, which we'll hear more about today, which is public land for public good, which would basically require the city to prioritize public land to go for to nonprofit organizations, including community land trusts, with the express purpose of permanent affordability um, and making sure that we maximize those few remaining public assets that we have since we've already lost so much of that public land. Um, through these policies over the past several decades. Um, I, there's also, you know, historically the city's process for land acquisition and disposition has been really extractive. I think, you know, a lot of us have heard about problems with the third party transfer program, the uh, now expired um, tax lien sale, which I'm sure we'll hear a lot more about from Deborah and the amazing work of East New York CLT members and others in this room on that issue. Um, so, you know, historically, from the founding of this country, um, you know, the government has taken land from indigenous people, black people, um, and maximized it for profit and building wealth among white people. That continues in our policies today, but can be reversed. Um, so we can look at ways to acquire and steward land over the long term that are less extractive and also make sure that when we are when land dispositions occur that they're going to the communities that um, will care for and benefit from that land over the long term. And last, there's also ways to expand community land trusts through policies that make it easier for uh, community land trusts to take control of privately owned buildings where the landlord is negligent or planning to sell the property. So there's, um, COFA at the city level and TOPA at the state level, um, which, you know, Tenant Opportunity to Purchase Act builds on existing policies that, for instance, Washington, D.C. has had for decades um, that would basically give tenants or community organizations the right of first refusal when certain properties go up for sale. It says, hey, give us the chance to be able to care for um, and hold on to these uh, buildings and use them for affordable housing permanently. Um, the next, and we'll, I'm sure, go into more of these in more depth. The next bucket um, is really around investing in uh, capacity of CLTs and providing financing. So, um, you know, we've seen that the city did um, in recent years hire 
uh, its first staff and start to form a program at HPD around community land trusts. Obviously, as mentioned, there's city council money that's going to CLTs, but we've also seen chronic understaffing um, of these agencies that have slowed down administration of these funds, slowed down responses to community land trusts and housing co-ops on community land trusts when they are working through their agreements with HPD, questions they have about following those policies. And over the weekend, I'm sure we saw announced that the mayor is planning another 5% budget cuts across the board. Mm -hmm. This is affecting the entire of affordable housing portfolio across the city, but will continue to hamper the CLT movement if we're not actually investing in our city agencies that help administer these programs. Um, another big piece of this is just that, you know, community land trust, while taking land off the speculative market is a huge part of addressing housing affordability, the reality is that this, the from the federal government down to the city, We've seen for decades dis disinvestment in low-income housing, capital, and operations. And community land trusts will be subject to the same challenges of all forms of affordable housing if we do not invest subsidies in making sure that housing can reach the lowest income tenants. That is something that we have to continue to fight for, um, for community land trusts and for all forms of affordable housing. Um, and last is that we, as I kind of said at the top, we really need to see community land trusts integrated into the city's land and housing plans as a whole. So New York City does not do comprehensive planning. Um, and, you know, there have been some efforts recently, some legislation that trying to introduce uh, comprehensive planning, but it will really need to be community-based comprehensive planning and community land trusts offer a tremendous model of what that participatory planning can actually look like. Um, and that's something that the city needs to continue to pursue and looking at its land resources as a whole, where are there opportunities for community land stewardship? Um, and rather than these sort of piecemeal situations where, oh, there's an urban renewal area, part of it can go to a CLT after you've fought for it for years and years and years, and we already gave away a bunch of other acres to private developers. Um, so thinking more strategically about how to expand community land trusts. Um, and again, as I mentioned, the housing plan, you know, looking at every opportunity to direct land to CLTs, um, you know, it shouldn't be a challenge for CLTs to find out from HPD staff, hey, what's the status of these lots and the RFPs? We want to apply for them. Um, so, you know, making sure that that commitment is really present. And then we've talked a lot about housing today, but not all of the CLTs on the panel are pursuing housing primarily and not all of those on, on the map either, right? And so there are more opportunities for the city also to look at expanding um, CLTs for commercial, uh, community space, and open space. And I might have gone over my time, but <laughs> tried to cram a lot of that. We're uh, summarizing the policy opportunities and challenges. Um, we're gonna, again, invite you all to take action um, towards the end of the session, including by contacting your council member to call for support for the policies that Nicely and others are fighting for. Um, we're gonna let you know ways to, uh, you know, to join the campaign, get involved, turn out for rallies, and if you're part of another community or affordable housing organization, um, to very much get involved in the nitty gritty of, um, of this advocacy. Um, so I'm going to start uh, just by asking each panelist a quick follow-up question, um, because I think some of there, there's so much exciting work going on, and I know you can cover it all in five minutes, but um, Deborah, who I should mention, was just awarded a very prestigious prize. Yeah, that's worth five. <laughs> Community Foundation. Um, uh, yeah, that's to Deborah. Um, I wanted to ask you to share more about East uh, New York CLTs were with the Arlington Avenue tenants um, to take over their land. Thanks, Dave. Um, the East New York CLT, we have a member on, um, a, a member on the East New York CLT who lives 
in this building. It's a 21 unit apartment building. And she just automatically became a tenant organizer for her building. Her building has been neglected for two, possibly three years by the landlord. No repairs, hot water goes out, um, leaks constantly, ceilings falling in, um, um, all kinds of people hanging out in the hallway because there's no lock or no security on the building. Um, it's it's just been a really nightmare for those tenants that are living in those in that building. So, like I said, um, Kathy McCardo became a instant tenant organizer. So she came to the CLT because she's a member. She said, "What can we do together?" So the CLT got together, met with the tenants who live in the building, and they said, "You know what? The CLT model works for us." So we got in touch with the landlord. We spoke with the landlord and we explained to him what our plan and our goal was for that building. And the goal is to acquire the land, to purchase the building, and in the long term, turn it into ownership units for the tenants that live there. Um, so we came to an agreement and the landlord loved the CLT model and he has agreed to sell the building to the East New York CLT. Last question, Mr. Kelly. Not an easy feat, but it's it's something that's not normally done because landlords of buildings, especially of that magnitude, are always looking to make a profit. This particular landlord is selling it to us. It's still at market rate. <laughs> Trust me, it's not cheap that we're doing this. Um, so we are looking for people to help us purchase this building because the tenants are really, really, really involved with it. We meet every week with the tenants. We have someone on our team who meets with the landlord um, in order to purchase this building. Um, we've come to an agreement that, God willing, <laughs> that by November of this year, mm -hmm. we will be purchasing full outright this building. Um, you're going to get information later about how to contact East New York CLT if you want to contribute to that capital campaign or otherwise support. Um, but it's very exciting. And um, Alexis, I wanted to ask you about the CLT. So you all are doing something that's a little bit different, which right. is that most CLTs first form and then they look for the land and how to get it. And you all have the land and you're right. putting together the CLT. So right. tell us how you approach that. So right now, the um, so the CLT has been working um, with Columbia um, Architectural School and Spitzer to do workshops. So we've had about... Um, two workshops so far, really introducing ourselves to the community, teaching them what the CLT is, how the CLT can be a form of reparations for us, because when I really took on this challenge, that's what it was really about for me, was um, ending generational homelessness. My mom was homeless. Um, I was homeless at a point, so I really wanted to stop the homelessness for my son, who's now 17 and has never had to experience homelessness or anything of that nature, right? But I've been such a huge advocate for it. So that's what it's really about for me is really putting some form of reparations into a community that I've lived in for 17 years. And I've watched them raise kids, work, pay taxes, and not really fully be appreciated by the political officials and the government, right, that they put into office to work for them. So for me, that was like... Not not only to get wealth for myself, my family, but for my community, because I don't want to see them pushed out by LM, Bluestone, Triangle Equity, those that have the 81 acres now and are being so irresponsible with it. Like I feel like that's 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 what the CLT is really there for. It's for us to prove that we can build our own economic development. Um hubs, right? We can do our own um, art and cultural spaces and build our own, 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 build our own form of home ownership. And that's what it's really about. We really don't want any more rentals in Far Rockaway. And we've been screaming after so many years that no one is listening to us and all they're doing is building rentals, which is not bringing the wealth back into my community. It's taking it out. 
Yeah, so that's what it really was for me, building CLC to build, you know, community involved and bring it back to the community. I see so many young people who, who grew up, you know, needed jobs and needed these things and everything that's really about building, building, being built around them is not for their, for them or their pockets. Like, you know, Deborah said, no more AMI. It's really about the neighborhood. Thank you, Alexis. Yes. Um, moving on to Michael, I wanted to ask you uh, if you could share an update and overview of the work that you all have done um, with the Heart Center, the Health Education and Art Center that you're planning in London. Yeah, um, you know, almost 10 years ago, we started envisioning what this vacant building, 25,000 square foot building that's been sitting um, underused, um, but so much need in our community. <laughs> and we saw it being uh, deteriorating over the decade, or the over a decade, uh, since 2011 when it was vacated. And so we started doing envisioning around what can this building do? What can it provide? Uh, what do we need most? Uh, and we had a list of things that, of course, community coming together has a lot of ideas. And that's where the experts are in our community, right? And that's why it's important to bring people together in our community to discuss the possibilities so we're not recreating the same mechanisms that have caused the harm. Top-down decisions, no, that's the ground up, that's the community driven. And so in that the envisioning sessions, multiple throughout the community and public spaces like community gardens, libraries, on the street, uh, we came up with pillars uh, for this building that we thought the main pillars for what this could be used for, or utilized for, would be health, education, and the arts. And, and because of the health disparities, um, the educational outcomes, living in a community that has the poorest performing school district, District 7, because of the cognitive development which we to our children, uh, is linked to the air they breathe. It, the, it, the environmental situations create the inequity or the inequities around education um, and health and, and, and arts and culture. It's super important to have that connecting ribbon um, and how arts and culture in our community is super important because that's what makes us rich. Um, our, our community was like the birthplace of two music genres. It contributed, it contributed to hip hop and salsa and graffiti art, right? And that came from a lot of struggle. You know, we created these arts and culture through struggle, but we don't have to live in struggle, mm -hmm. right? And we need to make sure that we em embrace the culture and, and the special, unique experiences our community has and the place to do that. So there is no art center or community center in our community like this that we're trying to create in the heart center for health, education, and the arts. And we have been, uh, we were forced to advocate for something that we knew we needed. And we pushed the city to release an RFP through decades of pushing and fighting and getting support from local electeds to give us a right to get into the building, do a feasibility study to show that we can make this something that's that's um, that's resilient, that's proven, that can stand the test of time, can be different than what we see being developed with top-down, top-down decision making. That community-driven solutions can be the way forward. And so uh, the feasibility study was done in, in collaboration with Manchi Architects, architectural firm, and, and many other consultants. Uh, putting together this feasibility study helped us be able to better tell the story about why and how this can happen and why it's so important. Because this structure also had a lot of history of helping our community be healthier. It was born out of the 24-hour, the 12-hour 12 -hour takeover of Lincoln Hospital in the South Bronx by the Young Lords of the Black Panthers, who out of that 12-hour takeover, created acupuncture and Reiki for recovery of opioid addiction and other types of addictions. But also it created the first patient bill of rights that 12 hour takeover. So community like activism and ground up, ground up decision and, and movement has had history in our community. And we're only trying to replicate and continue that path of having a holistic approach to community health, the same way the Young Lords and Black Panthers create a holistic approach to recovery. And so what we're doing now, and after the release of the RP, we responded to it. Um, and and we were successful in winning the release of the RP. So we have a lot to be proud of, uh, being the recipients and the winners of the RP that was released by EDC and H&H. 
right? That was the quietest, biggest <laughs> announcement I've heard of. <laughs> a decade of work in the Heart Center is going to be turned over to the hands of the community. Congratulations, Michael. <laughs> Um, as you know, not mine alone. I mean, our community has so much, you know, tenacity and resiliency. And in the face of everything we've been dealt, right, with high rates of asthma, obesity, diabetes, poor congressional district, poor performing school district, and still there fighting to stay and fighting to have healthier outcomes and really knowing that our future is what we create, right? And this building will create so much opportunity for our community. So it only starts here. This is the, this is just the beginning. Yeah. Right. Um, and yes, yeah, this is incredible news. Okay. So Sylvia, um, can you share with us some of the policies that other cities that you've seen other cities adopt or that you think the city should be looking at as models in addition to you know the community and, and an opportunity to purchase act and public land for public good? Um, that are already on our radar. Is there anything else that we all should be pushing for here in New York City or state? Yeah. Um, so yeah, I think, you know, we talked about TOPA as a model. Um, you know, I think there's also, I didn't talk about it as much, but when we're looking at sort of how the city can approach um, land acquisition and disposition um, with specific the specific goal of racial justice there are models for the collaborations between land banks and community land trusts um, and there is a bill also as part of the community land act for creating a, a land bank um, and you know in albany in atlanta um, there are examples of how uh, community land trusts can have policies that direct land to community land trusts giving them the right of first refusal um, giving uh, beneficiary rates to community land trusts. So those don't have to be competing models. They can work together and also work strategically to make sure that again, a land bank is not an instrument to be directing public land to for-profit developers um, and that it's prioritizing uh, long-term affordability. There's also, you know, in California, um, in recent years, there's been a number of um, tax incentives to support community land trusts in particular and help address uh, some of the challenges that they and all affordable housing um, developers and operators face. So there are a lot of lessons that we can learn from other places. Those are just a few. Okay, thank you so much. We're gonna um, start over to Mr. The questions. I'm um, going to see them coming in. And uh, let's start with one that's coming in from our virtual participants. Um, it, let's see, there's so many here. Let me, let me choose the right one. So, how, so community land trusts um, are about not just land ownership, but also about community led and controlled decision making. But what does that mean? Um, so let me ask any of you who want to answer that, how do you engage the community in organizing, in understanding, and helping to run the CLT and making decisions about which projects you're going to pursue? Alexis, well, I'm going to take that on. So right now we're in the midst of that. We're like doing bylaws. Um, it was like a lot of outreach. Um, remember, this process been has been going on for about maybe nine, 10 years with the real Edgemere Resiliency Plan with HPD. Right, so this was like kind of in the works and um, getting help from Columbia with resources to help us make flyers. We've been doing a lot of door knocking um, with the resources that Columbia gave us. We were able to hire um, a staff person in addition to funding that was given to us by um, Change Compacity Grant. We were given money by them also to hire a staff person. So we're actually been blessed to hire two staff people with the money that we got from CCF and then one person with Columbia resources. So that's how we've been really reaching out to the community. And then what I did was from the Edmund Resiliency, I met a lot of people and and so those members are also on the board. So they're homeowners, they're residents, they're, you know, to school assistants, but it's really about the door knocking and the grassroots. Like, like I said, this has been going on for 10 years. So people have already known about this project. It was just it being released to me and put in my hands to create a group 
to really facilitate it. So that's what the real grassroots is. Like we had the opportunity to work with a developer, but it wasn't the vision of the community that I knew. And so I just took a leap of faith and I'm happy that it did come to us because we're actually having those meetings with HPD, right? We're having meetings with an architectural engineering company that's going to do our vision the way we need to see it fit. So it's really just about making sure that you, um, those who have been in the struggle with you, you bring them with you, right? So like Michael said, it's really about the community, people that have been living there all their life. That's who my audience is and the young people. So we're, we're not only just making about older people, we're making it cross-generational too. Those who are in the room is also cross-generational, the young people that are coming up behind us. That's why I also did it for it too, my son's generation that's growing up. So we can't forget them in this process as well. Yeah. Hi, I'd just like to add a little to it. For the East New York CLT, um, we are what we call ourselves boots on the ground because we weren't afforded the opportunity as um, Edgemere to have property. Uh, so how we started out was um, we, we went out and we educated the community on what a CLT is. Um, Along with educating, we saw all these vacant lots. So we started doing surveys and we realized that there were over 250 vacant lots in East New York. So what we started to do was we started setting up tables, boots on the ground, doing surveys, asking the community, what is it that you want to see on this vacant lot? Yes, we know this lot has been here for over 20 years. Yes, we know it's an eyesore. It's vermin infected. It, what do you want to see on this lot that will help grow your community? So that's how the East New York CLT does it. Still today, we still do one-on-one -on -one workshops after three years because we know it's going to be an ongoing process in educating the community, but not only the community, we got to educate our elected officials, we got to elect, uh, educate the city council members, we got to uh, educate the government agency on just what a CLT is. Um, so it's, it's always ongoing. Um, I agree with Alexis how we have to continue to involve our youth because like I say, the work I do today, I don't expect to see it come to fruition in my lifetime. I'm fighting for the youth of tomorrow. That's, that's, that's where I want to see. I don't want to see my youth struggle and go through the hardship that I went through in life. I too also dealt with homelessness. I too dealt with the drug addictions in the past years. Um, I don't want to see that for the children of tomorrow. So the work that we do today is to encourage and develop and have resources for the kids of tomorrow. Yeah. No, no, go ahead. I'm finished. <laughs> one more thing. One more thing. With political officials, yes, our assembly members, our assembly women, Kathy Hobo, if you are out there and you hear me, hear me very clearly, sis, support community land trust. I don't want to have this conversation again when I'm 70 years old. And that is my issue with we're innovative. We have all this technology and AI. If you have all of that, why we still can't figure out New York City homelessness? And let me tell you another thing. These migrants don't want to be here, but because of corporations, they are here. And we need to keep saying that the reason why we're sitting at this table fighting for housing is because of corporate greed. Once we stop all that, we can be good. There's some and pay your taxes. I'm so sorry I'm getting off the topic. I'm serious. That, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. No, that's real. And the young body brought up the migrant crisis because I think that's in the backdrop of everything, right? And, um, you know, a lot to say on that, but just to be very clear, the CLT movement is not, you know, we need to be pushing back on all this crazy and dangerous rhetoric. Absolutely. Um, yeah. And then I wanted to after turn it to Michael as well after um, to just fill in how you all are <laughs> engaging community members. In this Okay. Um, thanks. Yeah, I just wanted to come back to, you know, part of what I think has driven the growth of community land trust is lack of democracy in our policy making and planning as a whole. And I think, you know, 
I think most people who are involved in community land trusts talk about some of the inherent conflicts, right? Like the idea is not to create um, exclusive communities, but we've seen that in the history of co-ops that can happen on occasion, right? And so we didn't really do the like, what is a CLT? I think we assumed a lot of people here have some familiarity with it, but even the design of the community land trust, there's separate governance that involves people from different parts of the community that, that's controlling sort of the land underneath the buildings and then the housing co-ops or whatever the, the co-op is that's on the land, you know, those members then have a vote on decisions that are fundamental to their housing or whatever it is. But the way that the bylaws are designed is that the more fundamental the decision, the more people need to be involved, right? So, you know, I think we've seen other, and we talk about this a bit in the report, like other affordable housing co-ops in the city have at times people decided to basically cash out, right? And the idea of the community land trust is to maintain that mission of long-term affordability. And I think, you know, one, this is something that's particularly important to me. I also worked with worker co-ops for a long time. One reason I think that providing adequate resources to CLTs, to any kind of cooperative, to community-led initiatives is because when people have to focus so much on just the basic, how do we get our expenses covered? How do we get this land? There's a lot less room for what's actually most fundamental to democracy, which is political education and ongoing organizing and deliberation. And it's really hard. And that's also the way that you make sure that community land trusts are not ex exclusive, right? That we don't replicate the same systems of oppression that are around us and that are like the reason for CLTs forming. Um, so just to add, you know, I know that there's some tension sometimes when people talk about what decision making look like looks like in CLTs and who gets to make those decisions. The idea is that it will be as inclusive as possible, um, but it will also take the right kind of policy making to do that. Yeah, and to that point, and thanks for bringing us back to the structure, um, I wanted to just say two things. One is that um, CLT, like the, what Sylvia described, right? The CLT is owning the land and then engaging community residents, people who live on the CLT land, the broader community and other stakeholders in making those decisions. And then, you know, really making sure that it's a community driven. That's the ideal. Um, so just want to say that CLTs, there are many CLTs around the country that are doing that to varying degrees, right? Um, some very little and some are squarely focused on that. They really see themselves as agencies for mobilizing community members to exert influence and shape their communities and be able to stay in their communities um, and, and remain safely housed. Um, but there's a lot of, I think, there are some groups that think about CLTs just as a pure legal device. It's just about owning that land and having that 99 year lease so that the owners of the property, the building on top, can't flip it. And I think, and one thing that we want to make sure is very clear about nicely and its mission is that we very much see these as, as being, neighbor, you know, it's about neighborhoods and opportunities that people have based on where they live. We all know this, right? Your zip code dictates so much of your opportunities in life. And that's not coincidental. It's by design of policymakers, banks, corporations, and all, and so much more. So we want to make sure that the CLTs aren't just, you know, creating a couple of affordable projects in an ocean of exploitation and displacement. We really want to make sure this is a movement that's about demonstrating what something that can be transformative, that can be at scale, right? And uh, and we're going to talk about that more. But just really quickly, Michael, anything else you want to say about how you all have engaged the community in South Bronx that you didn't get to say yet? Oh, just, I mean, our community has been taken from, right? Not listened to. Um, and often talked about how things are gonna be different in that. So a lot of skepticism around community land trust being that silver bullet of like the, the answer to all our wo our woes, right? But we have to show with action. So what we try to do is before hard work outside of the building and do what we want to do in that building on our streets. I mean, just this past week, we had love our block situation um, event, and we cleaned up this gray space that was full of pigeon poop for almost a decade. Mm -hmm. We went in there, we had a key to the lock, we opened up underneath a highway. It's raining cats and dogs up all around us. Mm -hmm. 
There was like seven of us, and Reefy just left. He was part of that crew, but it took only a small amount of people to make a difference. When you show your land trust is working like that in your community, you're showing action and not words, and that's how we organize. It's not about land. It's really about community. This is a tool to organize us, right, into doing, and how we do that is through action. And I think that's how we are able to really break that, that, that wall down of feeling like no one's listening to us. That's what our community feels. Because we feel the same way. We haven't been listened to. That's why we're creating community land trust or community land stewards, right? Because we want to do something different than what's been done before. And how we do that is by listening to our community, let them know what they have to say is important. And we're going to implement that. We're going to move on that. We're not just going to have a vision session, but there's no implementation on what's been said. We have all these public participation events. Come on, be, be engaged in this public participation, and you never have anything you said materialize into the final plan. Mm -hmm. So we have to, that's mm -hmm. that's our mission. Yeah. Yeah. All right, um, question, we'll take a question or two. Let's take a couple of questions actually from folks in the room, and we're gonna um, ask, get folks to ask the questions back to back and people can respond to whichever ones you Oh, girl, I think, I think those, we'll just have to, we might report we'll your questions. Okay, or I can be loud. Yeah. Um, <laughs> hi, I'm Lee Elon with the Mayor's Office of Environmental Remediation and uh, work with some of you. Great to see you. Um, I'm curious hearing a lot of these community engagement activities you just spoke about. Part of my work involves promoting the state's Brownfield Opportunity Areas Program and a smaller initiative of our office to give community pre-development planning Brownfield grants. And um, I'm wondering if those programs meet these needs. I'm not aware if any of you have used the BOA program. Um, is there a disconnect there that, uh, could be better connected or do I just need to be louder that we have money? <laughs> um, but uh, these types of activities you're talking about is what these funds are there to support. So I just wanna hear how it could work better. Okay, thank you for folks in online that didn't hear that. That was um, a question from Lee with the Mayor's Office of Environmental Remediation asking if CLTs are aware of and utilizing um, funding available from the Brownfield Opportunity Areas, and if not, why not? It sounds like Alexis is ready to answer that. Okay. <laughs> we need the money. So all kinds of organizations that need you to stand on every vacant line and say I have money. No, all jokes aside, I think that it's not being communicated properly that there's money available. And if there is money available, it has to specifically say you can use this money to hire one staff person to go do serving for the brown fields, or you can use this money to pay banshee architects to do this specific thing for you and that's the problem that a lot of clts is having um hpd can't figure out the money situation the mayor's office can't figure out how to get money to clts you have all this ai but you can't figure out how to get me money from three years ago what are we doing and one more thing please come back to the offices we need you to come back to the office the money's not hitting that's the problem. We need the money. And whatever the red line situation is going on, we're not getting the money. It's not properly funding falling from the council people's office when it comes to discretionary money. You got to change the policy on how you're getting us the money because we're not getting it. All right. Let's take on the okay. video. Had a question? Oh, okay. Yes. Um, this, is, this question this is for Alexis. Um, I wanted to, um, sorry, caught me off guard. Um, can you explain a little bit about the resiliency challenges that we have in real life your CLT for kind of like the rest of the CLT audience? Great question. I'm glad you brought that up. We were given the worst of the worst lots. Mm -hmm. And now we have to figure out how to make these lots not only um, resilient, but how to make them resilient to where there's another storm, 62, one to two family homes won't be destroyed. We were, can you bring up the map? If there's like a possibility, can you bring up the map for me with the lots? So sh I can show you guys what I mean by, um, we got the worst of the worst lots. Um, they're in a um, flood zone. Literally all of the lots that we have are in a, a oh, I'm sorry, in a flood zone. So for us, it's really trying to figure out the 
Oh, yes, here we go. So these are our 119 lots. As you can see, these all of these lots are literally in a flood zone. And for us, it's it's working with the Army Corps of Engineers to figure out how to make so the six so the light parts are the housing parts, the green parts are gonna be the open space parts, and then the two orange spots are our commercial spots. We're hoping that God blesses us with um two point one billion dollars. That's how much I'm going to need to make this community environmentally resilient, hurricane resilient. Like, I need some kind of money where if a tsunami comes, you can't knock this down. Like, even the tsunami can't touch it. That's the kind of money I'm going to need from the federal state, from the state, and the federal government. Yes, fed and state. I need $2.1 So for those out there listening online, Alexis Moore and the Real Engineer, CLT <laughs> needs $2.1 billion to build this, com this community. And that is real for me. Did I answer the question, my love? Yeah, and if anybody else uh, has resiliency yes. concerns in their CLT, feel free, you know. I could speak to that a little bit. Thank you. I mean, we created a waterfront plan because during Sandy, at low tide, we got four feet of water in our community. But we're not going to build housing on that. We're going to build green space to be permeable, make sure it can absorb some sort of can be that barrier to protect the community from because we have like some of the highest population of micro housing in the city four blocks away or three blocks away. So we had to create a buffer to protect this. There is no plan other than ours, but the land will be stewarded by the Mile Haven Port Morris Community Land Stewards to create this green buffer and access because we have no access to the peninsula that surrounds this community of 60,000 people. So it's multi-pronged, but resiliency is super important. We got a storm coming up, to, maybe coming up to Northeast right now, Lee, category four or five. We have not really done enough to protect communities like Edgemere, like East New York, like the South Bronx, that are extremely vulnerable to sea level rise, climate change. We can't build in places like that. We need to build green infrastructure to make sure that we can be resilient and be able to stay, or else we're going to be underwater. It's, it, you know, we see what happens in New Orleans, right? They want to build in other places. They're building on stilts. Are we prepared to do that? Are we going to create what already was there? We built over the natural resources that protected us. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, all right, so there's questions coming in, and please raise your hands if you have. I think she had a question in the back. No, sorry. <laughs> okay, then let me just ask. The young man, right? Okay. okay. All right, I was going to ask. Them. Okay. All right. All right. There were, uh, okay. Fifteen minutes okay. about left, so Jefferson okay. can answer that, and then. Okay. I just want to want to. The resilience. The East New York CLT has been working with an area. Um, it's divided in, it's half of it's Brooklyn, half of it's Queens. It's known as the home. But we call it the Jew Streets because of the names of the streets Amber, uh, uh, Jews, anyway. That, but what we've done is this area has been neglected for over 50 years. This area sits in a bowl. And the homes sit in the bowl. So when it rains, the bowl fills up. So that means the homes flood. These homes are still living with septic tanks. Who in this 21st century has septic tanks on their land? So when the, when the homes flood, the septic tanks over flood. So we've worked with the tenants, we've worked with the homeowners. We've gotten all the agencies together because they were having an issue. If the tenant complained, if the homeowner complained, they were told, oh, that's not Brooklyn, it's Queens. They would go, oh, it's not Queens, it's Brooklyn. Mm -hmm. So we got all the agencies, all the um, elected officials, council members together, come up with a plan to create resiliencies, do something about this flooding. So, so far, the East New York CLT has gotten rain water drainage in the area, which means now when it rains, the rain, you know, the rain doesn't fill up, it has somewhere to go. But our long-term long -term goal is to install a sewer system for these homeowners. I'm a part of the Abolish the Tax Lien Sale Coalition. Not one of those homes in that area 
have ever been on a tax lien sale, which means they're paying their taxes, but they're not receiving the services that they should be receiving. Mm -hmm. HPD has come in. Love you, HPD. HPD has <laughs> come in to work with us, but now they broaden the area. They want to redevelop the whole stretch of Linden Boulevard. And I remind them at every meeting, every meeting, I look them dead in their eyes and I say, you could talk about development because we know with HPD, they want to build high rises. Linden Boulevard, eh, okay, because that's what's already there. But you will not, and I repeat, HPD, you will not build one stick of anything on those stretch of streets until you install that sewer system, because that's what we're fighting for. Those homeowners deserve. And if you don't want to do the um the the, the the sewer system, do a buyout, and then we can return the land back to nature. Boom. <laughs> there we go. Um, we have a question from Kendall, from Dan, and then we'll uh, to. Uh, Next person, I don't know your name. Helen. Helen next. Okay, Kendall. So actually, it's not a question. It's to piggyback on what Alexis and Deb said. Um, I'm Kendall Jackson for Picture Homes. Um, we know the things. Board member Bronx CLT. But it's a justice, the lady from government. When we started our vacant property count in 2010, we reached out to the six city agencies that had the project listed. And you were nice enough to get everybody came back to us, I think, in, in a good time based on the city track record. But these agencies use a different computer program. We had to find somebody to turn six computer programs into one for Tom and Gotti to do what he has to do. You guys. <laughs> I know Alexis and Becky want you to talk to them. All of us want you to talk to us. But you don't talk to each other. Mm -hmm. If you can't mm -hmm. talk to each other, you can't talk to me. Mm -hmm. And that's your number one problem. I'm glad you got money. We'll take it. <laughs> <laughs> but you have to find a way for the city to work as one. Yeah. I don't understand why you have six different um, computer programs in agencies that have who are supposed to look over what land is free in the city. How many computer programs are you using across the city government as a whole? That's your problem. Mm, you have to get the city government together, yeah. and then you can work with us. I'm going to try to paraphrase Kendall, Kendall's comment. Um, Kendall's a member uh, of Picture the Homeless and was around in the founding for the founding of Nice Lee and is now on the Bronx CLT Board of Directors. And Kendall's point was really just about when, when PTH was doing a vacant property count years ago. Um, there were six agencies that you contacted to figure it all out. And I think it speaks to the lack of, you know, public data that's available and the challenges mm -hmm. getting with it. Um, but also with the need for coordination across agencies, if we're really going to bring models like CLTs um, and other forms of, you know, community-led development, you know, to fruition, that it's, you might have a friendly person in one area, someone less so in the other, and there's such power, there could be some sort of coordination and planning across agencies to really grow these kinds of institutions um, that are really important infrastructure that neighborhoods need. So thank you, Kendall, for that. We'll move to Dan. Um, thanks so much, Day, and everybody at Pratt and New Economy Project. My name is Dan Kroof. I'm a housing finance analyst at the City Council. And I have the pleasure of uh, assisting the CLT groups with their funding. Um, really great to hear what, what is up and uh, the updates. I just wanted to start, I mean, um, I wanted to talk about the mayor's the cuts because I think it's important that people know it's not 5%, it's 15%. Exactly. It's 5% in each of the next three plans. Um, and I also wanted to say at the outset that the council has consistently called um, for $4 billion in housing capital, uh, which the mayor committed to, and that commitment has not been, uh, you know, fulfilled. Um, and so I just wanted to say that at the outset. So the council has been consistent in calling for that level of city housing subsidy for capital. So my two questions were, of all of the recommendations, and it is helpful to see them, um, and I'm looking forward to digging into the full report, 
Is there one that you'd highlight as the most essential for unlocking the development of more affordable, I would say rental units, but if you want to say affordable home ownership or just housing generally, that's useful too. So what recommendation do you think is the most getting more affordable housing? And then just secondly, I'm really interested in the Arlington Avenue um, you know, uh, home ownership opportunities. Just was curious what the restrictions are on individual resale. How do we make sure that those are staying affordable home ownership opportunities? Thanks so much. Okay, so that's Dan Krupp with Council Finance. Two questions um, in addition to some really helpful feedback and background about the mayor's proposed cuts. Mm -hmm. um, so the question, one question is for East New York with the Arlington Avenue mm -hmm. acquisition that the CLT is planning um, so that the tenants will ultimately work to convert that building into tenant owned and controlled housing. So how, how is the CLT going to make sure that that housing stays affordable? What are going to be the restrictions that are put on? Okay. Um, what I'm going to say is, I may not be 100% correct, but this is what I believe we're envisioning, is that with all CLTs, there will always be a 99-year ground lease. In that ground lease, it caps the amount that you can sell your unit for. If I tell anybody who I'm talking to, whether you're a homeowner and you're thinking about putting your land in the CLT, if you're looking to make money to flip your house, the CLT is not for you. Mm -hmm. Because what we're trying to create is home ownership, rental units that will stay affordable in perpetuity. So that cap will say, okay, you can give back the um, uh, 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 investment. The investments that you put in, the the improvements that you put in, you can get that back, but you you're not going to make a windfall on it. Mm -hmm. So if you want to come into that to make sure that your children and your children's children have a place to stay and live, then the CLT movement, the CLT is for you. But if you're looking to make money, the CLT is not for you. Straight up. Mm -hmm. Did I answer? <laughs> okay, we're running out of time. So I'm just going to put Dan's other question on the table and invite the, the final question, and then we're going to go into take action stuff. So Dan's other question, which I think a lot of people here, I've seen others online asking this, is about the policy platform, the policies that NICELY members and others, there's 110 plus organizations signed on to this um, platform. Um, and you can check it out. We can show the slide at nyccli.org slash CLA. Um, so of those policies, you know, what what feels, if anything, people here or in the audience have feedback about what's most game changing for CLT? What will really move the needle in terms of helping land trusts develop permanently affordable and truly affordable housing? Okay. Okay. I, I I feel for me the cooperation of of our political officials, um, the banking industry. I think it really supports CLTs and really giving money and really supporting the idea of reparations, right? Because remember, this really isn't our land. This is really the indigenous people's land, right? So how do we work with our indigenous brothers and sisters also in getting access to land? Right, that's something for me as well because that is real, right? This is not just only our land; it's really also the Native American land too. So, really working with them, but just really getting support financially to help, you know, my board members. You know, we've been doing this work for free for almost almost 10, 12, 13 years now, right? So just really financially supporting the work. You know, people at HPD, people at the environmental, you know, protection agency, pick up your phones, right? And 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 um voice messages, call people back. Those things mean a lot to people like me who are working at CLT and who have families. People who are on the ground like me and Mike, we have family, we have full-time jobs. We're students ourselves at CUNY's. I have three kids, a 17-year-old, a three-year-old, and a five-year-old. I just have to get them all ready for school, doing homework and things like that, in addition to worry about how I'm going to fund the CLT. For me, it's actually financial more than anything. 
Um, I just want to add to that really quickly. So just the policies that we're pushing for, right? Just to make sure these are very clear. Topla and Topla, yes. Um, there's a couple, but what they're doing, so, you know, Community Opportunity to Purchase Act is going to give CLTs and other qualified nonprofits a first chance to make an offer when a multifamily building in their community is put up for sale. That's fabulous, right? They're going to get notice, they're going to have a timeline to reply, time to organize the tenants. But what do we? What do they need? They need access to nimble, appropriate loans, financing, and also not other forms. You know, capital that isn't debt in order to be able to make these projects work. And lawyers, I'm sorry. and lawyers, and lawyers to right. understand contracts, to understand how to form a non for profit, what is governance. You know, because there's real, there's different types of non for profit organizations. You know, how you can going to collect dues, things of that nature. Like how to really structure a board. And you got to also remember when you're in these communities of um, color, you're also dealing with trauma. So you got to organize around policy and trauma and things of that nature. So just our political officials and be mindful that we have. Um, really think they're a lobby against us in policy. So for those that are going to school, make sure you're going to school to fight against those that are putting policy against anti-housing, real affordable housing. That's what it is too. Making sure that we have people that support and are lobbying on our behalf. Like if I can't be there, I need other people to go lobby with the politicians about affordable housing and not have to worry about the real estate lobbyists because they have money. Right, so supporting the movement with money to fund policy, good policy, like Copa and Topa. Exactly, and if you, 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 we invite you all to get involved, whether you want to support figuring out how to get the policies over the finish line, throw your weight behind that, join us for rallies, actions, contact your electives. Um, if you want to get involved in some of the efforts that we're just beginning to really move forward to figure out how can CLTs collectively expand the kinds of funding that they can access on better terms than what's available and quicker and make sure that it fits the CLT structure. There's legal support needed, other training and technical assistance. So we really need all hands on deck to make this um, to make this work and we hope you'll reach out. Last question. Um, first of all, I wanted to say thank you so much. This has been like so inspiring and yeah, feeling mobilized. Mm -hmm. um, my name is Ellen Garrett and I'm with uh, the Flatbush Workshop for Design. We're working with Brooklyn Level Up on the Flatbush CLT. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I'm a landscape architect, so I would love to talk to all of you about resiliency. Um, bells going off all over the place. Um, I'm also teaching at Pratt in the landscape architecture department using the CLT as a model for how to design as a landscape architect. Um, and so, and I think all my students are listening in. Um, so a question I have for all of you is, with the shift away from land as a commodity to the stewardship of land, I'm curious, what are some of the unexpected or more creative land uses visioned by your community members who are experts in their neighborhoods? Mm -hmm. Okay, so we're going to do, I'm going to ask each of you to answer that and any closing thoughts that you also have. So the question was, um, so at, in this process of reimagining land, not as a commodity, but as something that's for the public good, what are some of the uses, creative, innovative, surprising, or otherwise, that your community members have come up with um, in the neighborhood? In any closing remarks you want to share? Um, so we're really like into art and stuff like that and having events. So we really want to use the space to do, you know, very things, the very things like have powwows, um, put on art performances. We um, are thinking about creating a worker incubator space. But the issue that we're having is that HPD builds housing. And if we don't have a housing plan, we can't access the 55 open space lots, right? So that's the issue for us. We have all these beautiful ideas and all things that we want to do, but HPD is like, where's the money? Where's the insurance? Who's going to do this? Who's going to do that? And remember, we only do housing. So you need to come up with a housing plan in order to be able to get to the green space activation plan. Um, I want to thank everybody for being here. I will definitely talk to you after we're going to talk. And just remember, um, support us. Make sure you, you tell your council members about COPRA and TOPA and have them support us. And just come out to various meetings and things of that nature. And just thank you for having us here and listening to our story. Yeah, I mean, around resiliency and how we would do that, you know, that waterfront plan I spoke about, and and the, and why that's and how that's so important is because of the need to keep us alive for the next and, and survive the next storms that are gonna inundate our community. And so we work with various institutions like Pratt, UPenn, Columbia, Syracuse, different urban planning and um, 
landscape architect firms to determine like the best way to create the resiliency and recreation we need. Um, but that's built into multiple different spaces around our community as well. We work with Lee and others, Mark who now is retired at OER, um, to look at how we could reclaim green space that are unutilized spaces on, like maybe traffic triangles. Uh, we'll plant trees, we'll plant tulips and things of that nature in those areas. We'll reinvent or recreate or reinvigorate the, the spaces that have been not really utilized in for resiliency, for permeability, um, to create the bioswells and along the path to our waterfront. Um, and also to make sure we can try to hopefully remove some of the contaminating sources that are there. So along resiliency is also in included not just in water, but also in air and noise. We're about to deploy like a 25 note network of air quality monitors throughout my Haven, so that we can fight back on air quality issues, but make sure we're totally resilient. So we can really figure out how these sources are hurting us, um, how we can make sure our community can stay and, and healthy and have healthier outcomes. And looking any way possible what we have left in public lands, if it's not buildable, it will be great. Okay, um, I just want to close and also thank everyone for coming out and being online and listening and have a true interest in the CLT movement. Um, what we see is, as um, my partner over here said, is HPD. There's a lot that we love to build a community center on because every community is not doing or, or is not interested in housing because they're already oversaturated saturated with housing. So let's create something for our use because our, uh, our use, youths are running rapid in the street because they have nothing or nowhere to go. But we can't build a community center on the land that's owned by HPD. HPD says, oh, no, it's got to be housing. Mm -hmm. But the area is already saturated with housing. So how do we go about changing that so that we can acquire the land to build what the community says they need? Mm -hmm. Not what HPD needs, which is mm -hmm. to make money, but I like we all are in a housing crisis, but let's share it amongst all communities when it comes to developing housing. Um, acquisition money is very, very important because as a CLT, we're a non for profit organization. We don't have money to acquire land. So we need the government to have some sort of pot of money that can be used by CLTs to acquire land. The building that we're trying to acquire, we have to go after you philanthropists to say, hey, could you give me a million bucks, you know? But still in all, there should be a pot of money for acquisition. And I also wanna say a, a word, another word that I hate that the government uses, HPD especially, is capacity. <laughs> they say CLTs don't have capacity. Mm -hmm. But yet and still, when that other non-Black indigenous company said they wanted to build, you said, okay, I'll give you the land for a dollar. They didn't have any previous building experience. How are we going to prove that we have the capacity until you give us something to prove and build on so that we can show you that we have the capacity? But with this building that we're getting ready to purchase, without HPD participant in purchasing it, yes, we're still going to need them for rehab. But I mean, we're going to say to them, okay, yes, we have capacity now. We are running this building. Give us our land. Give us some more land. And let us do what we need to do for our community. Thank you. <laughs>
CLTs are looking for partnerships with developers that are mission aligned with technical assistance providers and so much more. Um, and finally, a huge thanks again to Pratt for having us in person. I think that is a 